so I think we just talk about the pivot in general, right? Because mm. whatever it is we're doing, we don't always be like, okay, well, here's the next linear move and here's the next company. And it, it doesn't look like that for most people out there. So yeah. whether you were at a startup and you want to go to a big firm or vice versa, or um, you were on your own for a little while and you're like, I'm ready to go back and work for somebody else and not have the stress. Michelle Tillis Letterman. We're finally doing this. We're having our chat, our little corner. Can we talk about this for a second? Because for a minute I was like, I like the connectors corner, but I almost feel like it's, it's probably more career corner because you have such a diversified set of skills that you can help the community with. Yeah, I agree. I, I do everything related to you know, career, but with that thread of connection and how do we create mm. those relationships that are going to make the difference in our career? So it's a little bit of both, but I think you're right. We'll call it career corner. Absolutely. And, and actually I'm, I'm so much more excited about it with it being <laughs> career corner. So I went to the internet. I went to the podcast when you were on a little bit ago and, and asked for questions. I got some questions on Instagram. And so let's just dive in. There's actually, we got some really different ones, questions that I've never gotten in my career as a creator. So that's really fun. Cause I'm going to be leaning on you hard for a lot of these. Let's kind of start with a bit of a softball. I want, I'm very curious about how you feel about this. Um, Jewel Arenas asked, is it better to be a generalist or specialist in your field? Yes, this is a question that I hear all the time. And even in my own field, there's a phrase called there's riches in the niches. Mm. And that means that that specialization um, enables you to be really focused and targeted and people understand what your sweet spot is and what to get, you know, your expertise for. So for some industries, for some fields, that's really great. Um, but also for some personalities, it's really not. And I'm one of those personalities. <laughs> I have been hearing there's riches in the niches and really specialize and be really targeted and know exactly, you know, what you want to do and who you want to serve and how you are going to help them. And that's great for those people who have that clarity and that passion for something that narrow. It is really going to help with your marketing. It's really going to help with landing clients and for increasing your, I guess, brand awareness. Right? So there's great things about being a specialist, but I can't say it's better because I know it's not better for me. Hmm. And um, so those that are generalists, um, it really does tap into a personality that gets bored really easily, <laughs> right? So if this sounds like you of somebody who likes the new challenge, who likes different things each day, um, who you know really loves the continuous learning, that generalist environment gives you um, that, that input that you need to feel engaged. And that's kind of what I need. I, you know, <laughs> I get bored easily. And for me, I love what we're doing now. It's like, I'm not talking yeah. about the book every time I'm like, ah, there's a new question I can answer. And I find that really engaging. So, um, be aware of the pros and cons of each and which personality type is a better fit for you. That's a really, I like that you said that because it, is another way of saying like, it really is dependent on who you are and what it feels like to do your best work. So I, what's exciting about this is you do an, an, you have a number of books, you do an amazing job of marketing yourself. And in a lot of situations, if somebody's new to that, they are going to get advice from the marketing industry about being specialized or niched or on some level. But you seem to do a fantastic job of marketing yourself as a self-proclaimed now generalist. So where do you where do you feel like what is the winning strategy of that? Like how do you well illustrate and talk about what you do so that you can be a generalist, keep your career interesting, continue to diversify and collaborate into new and different areas that continue to evolve you? I mean, it, it, the marketing I think is where people disconnect from how they make themselves a success as a generalist. So it's really interesting because it depends on, you know, who, what type of career you have, right? So for us, 
it does sort of make sense to be more specialized because we're building that brand. But yet you have the specialization and I, I mean, you have, yes, you have the niche and I have kind of the broad. Um, so for people who are in corporate America, you know, a generalist is really great because it gives you opportunities and it allows you to jump off of a story um, in order to kind of make that next pivot. And I think we got a question about pivoting, which we can take mm. next, but um, the idea of, you know, this can also look like this. So there's some great things there. And the answer to your question is, I have honestly always struggled with the marketing um, because of You it. have? Of course. Stop I it. it. Somebody... You would not be able to tell. <laughs> mm -mm. Um, it took me a really long time to figure it out. And you know how I did it? And so for the parents out there that can relate to this, somebody asked me, um, how would you explain what you do to your son? And, you know, if it could be your niece or your, you know, whoever it is in your life that's young. Yeah. And at the time, my son was like eight or nine years old. And I said, well, I would tell him I would help people work better together. And it just landed. And so when you think about being a generalist, you can think about a specific impact that you want to have, but the way in which you have that impact can be really broad. And so for me, helping people work better together, um, communicating to connect, these are kind of the, the words that I would put on my t-shirt of what drives me. How I do that could be through training, through coaching, through speaking, through writing, um, you know, who I do that for, I'm agnostic. So I get that diversity that I'm looking for. Am I doing it through, you know, training on leadership or on, um, you know, how to connect to your brand and your message and public speaking and, and, and I can do all of these topics, but they're always going to have that thread of why, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I was, I'm actually listening to Simon Sinek's book, um, Start With Why right now. And it's really the same idea here. If you are a generalist, start with why. And for me, it is um, why, because we need to be better connected because we're going to be happier and healthier and we are going to have better results and we're going to be more successful. I love that. That's a great, that's, that is the answer. And I think that that helps anybody go, am I a generalist or am I a specialist? Well, when you start with why, which is by the way, a fabulous book, everybody needs to pick up by Mr. Sinek. Starting with why is going to help you try to figure out where you are going with it. And instead of choosing, well, I, th I think I want to be a specialist versus a generalist. What are you doing to actually solve problems for people? How do you generate those solutions and how specific is it? And how specific are the people who need it too? I think that that kind of shapes as you go along as well. I love that. Great answer. <laughs> I, you know, and, and I think that makes me more specific. Yeah, right? And so, but I still get to put my hands in a lot of different buckets. But one of the things, as you said that, that I started thinking about, I was visualizing LinkedIn and how many connection requests I get from people saying, I help da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm afraid that if what's what I just said, everyone's going to go put there, I help blah, blah, blah. And for me, I see that and I go, I kind of cringe a little bit. Why? I actually think that's great. Um, I think because everybody's doing it right now. Yeah. And it's funny how many things that were talked about like 10 years ago are now like very, very commonplace, which is kind of good news, but also now it's becoming mundane and un and not unique and people aren't really thinking outside of the box. And it just screams, I'm going to, um, you know, pitch you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So I see those. It's like, I help coaches. Oh, they see I'm a coach. They're now going to try to pitch me something. Mm -hmm. um, and so it doesn't feel, you know, as connected. So yet I say my phrase is helping people work better together. Um, maybe it's just the phrasing. I just want you to think about in your own marketing, how you're putting it out there and making sure that it really feels um, connected to you to what would actually come out of your mouth and that doesn't feel formulaic. Mm. So maybe focusing less on who you target, which actually I, I, I've been changing my mind a little bit about this too, in regards to the niche that I think if you're really, really good at what you do, then that very specific thing that you do, no matter how general or specialized it is, 
you should be able to do it for different types of people or different types of businesses. So rather than getting hyper-focused on the individual, um, which is a very interesting take coming from me because I have always been hyper-focused on my one viewer, being much more clear about what is the solution you deliver no matter who it is you work with? When you do your very best work, what is the solution? Because that's what it sounds like to me when you're saying, I help people work better together. I can visualize you going into a small business. I can visualize you going into a department in corporate America. I can visualize you working for an, uh, an arm of the government. I can visualize you sitting down with some kindergartners. Like I can visualize that result with a multitude of clients. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hmm. And, and even that helping people work better together is narrow for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, interesting. And, yeah. So I, I love this question and I hope the person who sent it in understands that there is not one right answer. It's the right mm -hmm. answer for you and to find what you are struggling with in the question <laughs> And that's the adaptation that you make, right? Yeah. So just ignore the should. Everybody's told me I should specialize and I should focus and I should narrow and all of that stuff. And you know what? If I should oh uh, stop shouldn't all over me, right? Like Absolutely. <laughs> and I, I say that all the time. I completely agree. And I also, every time I hear you say it or anyone say it to me, I think of all of the things that I have changed in my business over the years because I was told that I should, even though I knew that it was a little outside of the box that I was doing it rather than maybe outsourcing it to someone or, or whatever. And then things started to fall off the rails because I listened to someone telling me what I should do. It's, it's really amazing how, even though you can be so good at not shooting on yourself, you still let people do it to you. And then you go, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I shouldn't have listened to your should. This is not good. Oh I always say like everything that we do can be put into four buckets, get to want to, should do, have to. And that if you can't reframe whatever it is you're planning on doing with a get to, or a want to, mm -hmm. then maybe you shouldn't be doing it because a should is somebody else's want to for you. Understand <sighs> why they want that for you. That's really good. Yeah. I, the amount of projecting, if you just look at everyone's like, you should do this or how, why would you do something like that? Or it's always coming from their own personal experience. And that's totally fine. We choose to end up taking it personally. Oh my gosh. That that's, this is a great question. It's spun off know. into a lot of different things. Okay. Let's go into the question that um, you had mentioned earlier. Memoirs of an heiress asked how to pivot to corporate work after a number of years that they spent as a director in a family trust fund. So I feel like what's happening here is there's a really specific line of work that she's in and now she's trying to branch into a completely different arena. And I think a lot of people can connect with that, whether it's this specific of a, of a career track or not. How do you pivot to corporate? So I think we just talk about the pivot in general, right? Because mm -hmm. whatever it is we're doing, we don't always be like, okay, well, here's the next linear move and here's the next company. And it, it doesn't look like that for most people out there. Yeah. So whether you were at a startup and you want to go to a big firm or vice versa, or um, you were on your own for a little while and you're like, I'm ready to go back and work for somebody else and not have the stress. Mm. Um, oh my gosh. So much of that happening the last couple of years. <laughs> right. So much. So many um, entrepreneurs I know thinking about that. Yeah. Everyone's like, oh, I'm going to start my own business during COVID. And then I'm like, you know what? This is not the lifestyle for me. So there's all of these pivots happening. And so let's just talk about a pivot in general. And really what people struggle with is they're projecting their own fears, their own insecurities about that change onto the interviewer and onto the employer. And so what I tell people is you need to believe you first. You need to craft the story that makes sense to you in order to convince somebody else of that story. So, mm. um, you know, whatever it might be of, you know, why you chose to do this and, you know, what that career path is like, so for example, I'll use my own story. Um, I don't know if your listeners know, but I'm a recovering CPA. 
<laughs> I don't know if we've ever talked about that. Right? I maybe briefly, but d- we definitely didn't go in into detail on that. So I more details, first, please. Yes, <laughs> I spent the first decade of my career in finance. So if you want to talk about pivot, I've done it. Mm. I was an auditor. I did mergers and acquisitions. I did hedge fund investing, venture capital. I was the only woman on a trading floor. Like I spent 10 years heavy finance. So how the hell did I get to do what I'm doing now? Right. And it's about understanding the pivot. So when I started to make my move, it wasn't like, okay, I'm a communications expert. And I was a communications and writing minor. Just, I do have some education in it. Just, you know, I don't want to scare people away, but (laughs) um, (laughs) But I went to the American Management Association where I had taken a class while I was working for the bank and the bank allowed me because I told the CEO I could do this. And he said, okay, but you still have to do everything else. And I said, okay. So getting some experience internally is a great thing to do, whatever role that you're in. And as you think about the next pivot, like how can you get it in that safety net? And I went up to the American Management Association. I said, hey, I'm a trainer. I train communications. I want to train for you. And they looked at my resume and they said, no, you're a finance trainer. And I said, okay, hi, I'm Michelle. I'm a finance trainer. I want to train for you. (laughs) It wasn't what I wanted to train, but Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a trainer. I wanted to, to be an adult educator. And if my way of getting in that door was to teach something that I could teach, even if it wasn't my heart and passion, great. There was the beginning of my pivot. Mm-hmm. And then I got four star ratings on every class I taught. I, I taught things like take the fear out of finance, which is not the course title, but that's what I would call it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and debits and credits, like really fun stuff, but I would do it through storytelling and people, I would say, okay, the bowling alley story, what accounting concept is that? And, you know, I would get these rave reviews to the point where they're like, okay, Michelle can teach anything. And I was able to teach anything. Mm. And so that's how you start the pivot um, is finding that connection point. So when I said, all right, I'm now an entrepreneur, (laughs) I said, my target clients are finance because I get them, right? This is who I was. This is, I understand their struggles. And so, you know, for the first several years of my business, JP Morgan was client number one, um, Deutsche Bank was number two, and Morgan Stanley was number three. And then 2008 rolls around and the financial markets crash Mm. and I then can broaden, but I had that platform. So understand what pivots can look like is the first thing I want to tell you. They're not necessarily like a direct line, but the line that needs to be direct is how your skill set, how your passion, how your interest take you to that next place. Yes. What I'm also hearing is, is just leveraging anything in your toolbox that you've gained up until this point. And that is what makes pivoting so cool is because your pivot can be different than anyone else's pivot. Like this question is very specific. That's because everyone's pivot is very specific to their own experience individually. So in this particular line of work that you've been in for the last three years, how can you look at it and reflect on the tools in your arsenal, the skill sets, the experience that you can then say, okay, if I were to go and try to get a completely different type of position, what have I learned during this time that I can apply there? And if it gets you into one door, it just starts that process going down the road. I, I, that's a, that is, I think that's eye opening for a lot of people. And I love how you phrased it, leverage all the tools in your toolbox. And the cool thing is, and here's another thing. It, sometimes if you don't believe your own story, what I want you to go out as um, to people that you know and who know you and ask them what they think your story is. Mm-hmm. Because it's really powerful when somebody else hears it. When I left the trading floor, it was because of a risk management firm that I was using as a vendor. Like they were my, I was their client, right? And they hired me as their director of marketing. I have no education in marketing, like not my background whatsoever. And I was actually trying to connect them to somebody I went to business school with saying like, well, tell me what you're looking for. I know everybody because we all got laid off, you know, in 2001. And I'm in the middle of this conversation and I was like, wait a minute, are you offering me the job? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, I don't know 
anything about marketing. Like literally that came out of my mouth as <laughs> <laughs> because it was just so genuine. I just didn't feel yeah. like I didn't believe that story. And they're like, yes, you do, Michelle. And I ended up taking that job and it was, it was the last job I ever had before I started out on my own, because wow. when I took that job, I said, okay, but here's my, you know, this is a short-term three to five year. This is what I'm doing. I'm going to build this on the side. And they were like, cool, cool, cool. We're good. So when somebody else sees something in you and has that belief, try, I always say, try on that sweater and see if it fits because they might see something that we don't see in ourselves because we're often yeah. really hard on ourselves. Oh, I love that. Okay. We have so many more questions, but I've got to call it on this episode of Detailed Therapy. This has been a banger of a first episode of the Career Corner. Michelle, thank you for your time. Um, you're going to be right back for another episode. So yeah. thank you for sharing. Everybody check out Michelle on Instagram, MT Letterman. I'll link to it in the show notes and all the other details for where you can tune into her newsletter and check out her website and find out all of the fabulous things in her general toolbox. <laughs> See you on the next episode.